When we lived in the interior of northeast Brazil, there was a daily scene that transpired every day in front of our house. Lots of traffic. Few cars, few trucks, but lots of people walking. But not only that, in that steady flow, there was always a multitude of people walking that road with their donkeys. And their donkeys were loaded down, everything from household furniture to large piles of sugar cane on their backs. It was not unusual for the donkey to be loaded down so heavily, especially with sugar cane, that they could not stand the weight. Now, the worst thing in the world that can happen to a donkey owner is to have his donkey sit down with a whole pile of sugar cane on his back. Because you can't get him up unless you take every bit of that sugar cane off and let him stand up and then repack it. And once a donkey sits down, uh, it is time consuming to get them back on their feet. I've seen my share of donkey abuse just right in front of our house in Brazil. If their master is really cruel, they will beat those donkeys and beat them unmercifully. If the master is kind, he understands the problem. The donkey just cannot stand up under the weight. He's put too much on its back. He's expected too much of the animal, and he takes care of it. We had a gardener named Julio. Our gardener took better care of his donkey than he took care of himself. At least he bathed his donkey every week. When, when my Brazilian thoughts come back to me and I think about the donkey, I think about humble service. When we think about a donkey, we don't, we don't see many of them anymore. We may see a few of them in a Christmas play or pageant outdoor drama kind of thing, but we don't see donkeys here like Gloria and I saw them in Brazil. <clears throat> But when you see a donkey, you really are looking at a beast of burden. And serving is what they do best. And when you observe the variety of tasks that an owner gives his donkey, you cannot deny the fact that humble service is their trademark. I don't know of a, another animal that better demonstrates servanthood than a donkey. And yet, ironically, in, in Brazil, the absolute worst thing that you can call a person is a donkey. Ironically, that's true. And yet, on the other hand, they are humble servants. Keep that in mind this morning. The tribe of Levi was set aside by God to be the priests and the spiritual leaders of Israel. Scripture calls them Levites. And you need to know, and you probably already know, that Levi was the third son of Jacob. His mother was Leah. And Levi had a son named Gershon, from which we derive the term Gershonites. 
from the scripture that I read this morning. And I, I, I got a little amused because as I read this scripture, I could see your minds churning. What in the world has this passage got to do with the sermon? Well, here it is. Priestly duties were divided up to the various members of the tribe of Levi. And the priestly duty of the Gershonites was to carry the burdens. And the burden basically was all of the paraphernalia that went, went with the tabernacle, the tent that they worshipped in. The Gershonites were known for their humble service. They were known for being burden bearers. The Levites had a noble calling, but one part of that noble calling was um, an humble service. They were called to be the kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Uh, they didn't have a temple in those days. It was a tabernacle. It was called a tabernacle. It was a portable tent, a large one, with a lot of paraphernalia attached to it. It was a sizable task to put that tent up and to take it down. But that's what they had to do. Every time they moved from one place to another, the Gershonites had to take care of transporting, taking down, putting up, transporting this tent, this tabernacle. That was their responsibility. I want to remind you this morning that just as God called Israel to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, he called you and I to serve him, to be his ministers. And there are various degrees of ministry. And I'm not going to go into all of that this morning. But within the larger calling, there are in the ministry duties of responsibility that God lays upon us that are characterized as humble service. What we learn from this is that everybody in the priesthood, everybody serving the Lord in this special way had different responsibilities. Some would interpret the law, some would preach, some would do humble service. The idea here is that all are to serve. And that's the way God has set it up. Everybody can't preach, everybody can't teach, everybody can't do some of the things that, that need to be done in a church. But everybody can find a place, a niche, to serve. And the happiest churches I know of are those where people find their niche. Where they find that little place of service that, that they love, they can do it, they want to do it. And they do it well. But it's the word serve that sometimes to some becomes an offense. The very thought of humble service can be repulsive. Who wants to do humble service? And yet what would happen in our society if no one was willing to collect the trash? How many times do you thank the Lord for the garbage folks that come by and pick up the trash? Can you imagine if they didn't? Who wants to scrub floors and bathrooms? But can you imagine if there were people who wouldn't do it? What would happen to our quality of life if no one was willing to clean out the sewer lines of our city? Or as we see laborers digging ditches, digging holes and trenches to, to put the cables through, all through our city. What if nobody wanted to do that? What if no one was willing to get grease on their hands to fix our automobiles, our trucks, 
or change the oil? What if no one was willing to crawl under our houses and repair the air conditioning units or get up into tight fitted attics to work on them? What if we had no people to fight our crime in our neighborhoods? Or leave their comfortable beds in the middle of the night to go out on an emergency call with the EMS? What if no one was willing to work in, a, in an assisted living home? What if no one was willing to work with Alzheimer's patients? Or people who can't help, cannot in one way or the other do one thing for themselves. Humble service. What if there were no waiters or waitresses at our restaurants? And in the church, what if no one was willing to do small tasks? What, where would we be? What, where would we be if we had a fellowship, a little celebration, and everybody walked out and expected somebody else to clean it up? What if no one was willing to prepare a meal and take it to a family that was really needing it? Or to sit at the bed of a dying patient for hours? Or what if no one was willing to listen to your story of heartbreak or sorrow? You know, I think I could go on for a long time here, but you get the point, I hope. Almost everything I have named is an humble service, but so necessary to the well-being of our society, so necessary in taking care of the diseased, the sick, the, the lame, the blind, Opportunities for humble service abound around the world, and yet there are many people who want no part of it. That's below me. I'm not going to do that. Leave that to somebody else. Isn't it ironic that humble services that make our lives so enjoyable and blessed are the very services that so many people dislike or devalue? What I want to say this morning is that Jesus exalted and modeled humble service. He's the role model for it. He's the burden bearer of all ages. You see the humble service of Jesus as he ministers, ministers to a leper. Who wanted to touch a leper? Nobody. He was unclean. Jesus dared to touch a leper. You see the humble service of Jesus as he interrupts his schedule to meet the need of a woman who has been hemorrhaging and needs his healing power. But he had a schedule. He's Jesus. He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Does he have time for that? Yes, he did. You see the humble service of Jesus as he prepares a hot breakfast on the shore of Galilee after his, his disciples had fished almost all night and had caught nothing until they obeyed his voice and the nets were filled. And then they were exhausted from pulling in the fish. But Jesus had a hot meal on the shore. Charcoaling fish isn't new. You see the humble service of Jesus on the cross. Who wants to die for somebody else? Who wants to die such a cruel death for somebody else? Humble service requires an humble servant, and Jesus was that. I would remind you also, there's a sacredness about humble service. There's something really special about it. You think about that when your garbage man comes and picks up your garbage. 
You think about that when you see city workers cleaning up a sewer drain. You think about that in any of the humble services that I've mentioned. There's a sacredness about it. In today's world, the church ordains deacons and men and women and pastors. It's our way of sort of setting them apart. I think I've told you a number of times, uh, but it's always a, 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 an interesting thing about Charles Haddon Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers of the world, known as the Prince of Preachers. He would not be ordained. Uh, I want to read you what he said. This is his words. I was never ordained by mortal men, for I did not believe in, the, in having their empty hands laid on my head. If they had any of them, any spiritual gift to impart to me, I would have been glad to receive it. But as they had nothing to give me, I could not accept it. I believe that every true Christian is ordained of God to his particular work. That is a key point here. You don't have to be officially ordained by a church to serve the Lord. God ordains us to serve. He calls us all to serve. Spurgeon said, I believe that every true Christian is ordained of God to his particular work and in the strength of that divine ordination, let him not bother his head about merely human forms and ceremonies, but just keep to his proper work and shoulder his own burden. I'm not advocating that we do away with ordination of deacons or ministers or anything like that. That was Spurgeon's particular thought, very powerful one. But what I think he wanted us to all understand is that we recognize the sacredness of all service that we do in the name of Jesus. That's the point. When the Gershonites carried a tent screen or a curtain or even a cord and they carried a vessel of flesh hook or knife or whatever they did, they did it unto the Lord. It was an humble service in those days. Nobody really wanted to do that. But that was God's assigned task to them. Paul challenges us when he says whatever you do do it to the glory of God and that's the point do you visit the sick have you gone to a prison to see someone that's sacred work do you cook pies and cakes for families in need that's sacred work do you sit down even though you've got a busy schedule, and listen to someone whose heart is broken? That's a spiritual work. If you have the gift to teach, do you teach? Do you have the gift to preach, do you preach? If you have the gift to sing, do you sing? Are you sitting out there in the pew when you need to be in the choir? That's sacred work. Do you serve your fellow man for the glory of God or do you do what you do for self-recognition? The first command of a burden bearer is to be clean. Even the Gershonites were to wash themselves and to wash their clothes. If we are to do humble service for the Lord, then we need to do it with a transformed life. A life transformed by the saving power of God. If we do the Lord's work, we should make sure that it is the Lord's work. Don't attempt good deeds with ulterior motives. Don't attempt good deeds while at the same time you're being dishonest. Don't attempt good deeds when your attitude is sour. Have you ever done something that was really good to do, but you had a poor attitude in doing it? Better not do it at all. 
Ulterior motives, dishonesty, a sour attitude are all tools of the devil. You cannot serve the Lord with the devil's tools. Make certain that your servant, that your service, that your life is clean and make sure that your service is reverent. Whatever you do. In the story of the Good Samaritan, Jesus spoke of the priest and the Levi who passed by the wounded victim and left him to die. They were examples of those who see a need and say, that's not my job. When I, had, when I was in a larger church, in each church where I was pastor, I would tell my staff, I do not want to hear you ever say, when somebody asks you to do something for them, that's not my job. Our job is to minister. Our job is to be of use to somebody else. Our job is to help people. Our job is to encourage people. Our job is to invite people to come to our worship, to come to our Sunday school. Our job is to promote the kingdom of God in every way. Don't ever hear yourself saying, that's not my job. My beloved pastor mentor when I was coming up I was so young in my teens and he embraced me and helped me and encouraged me pastored in later in the middle part of the state and he had a church that told him when they were asking about different things that needed to be done in a, in a meeting they told him, we pay our staff to do that. I think he had a fresh sermon for them. Reverent service is unselfish service. It is done for the glory of God, and a true servant of God will never ask, what's in it for me? But we'll ask, how can I glorify God by doing this? A humble servant of God will say, that's not my job. Oh, it may be something that you may be not a be able to do exactly for yourself, but, but you can find someone who can do it. You, you can get help for that person who's crying out to you. Humble service comes down to one of two things. <laughs> you remember that when Jesus stood before Pilate, that this ruler had the power and the authority to do the right thing? He could have easily become an humble servant. He could have easily used his power to release Jesus, but he didn't. You know what Pilate did? He called for a basin and washed his hands of the matter. On the other hand, before he died, up in that upper room with his disciples, when not a single one of those disciples even attempted or started to do what they should have done, Jesus took a basin and went around and washed everybody's feet. He humbly got down on his knees and did the customary thing that none of his disciples dared do or forgot. And so every day, you and I have opportunities of service placed before us every day. We can say, that's not my job. Or, like Pilate, we can say, I just wash my hands of that, I'm not going to have anything to do with that. Or like Jesus, 
we can pick up our bowl, our basin and towel, and humbly work for the glory of God. That's what the Christian life is really about. Humble service. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our hymn of invitation this morning, number 447. And as we sing this hymn, as God's Spirit speaks to your heart, you make the decision that God lays upon your heart. If you've never received Christ, here's an opportunity. If you are looking for a church to join and God is speaking to your heart, this is your opportunity. If you want to rededicate your life, Whatever is, it is that God is doing in your heart, whatever he's asking you to do, this is the moment of decision. Number 447, let us stand as we sing.